Need is out of the window now, as BBC Two is all about I want. We're human beings, and human beings are not machines. Our first response to anything is emotional, not intellectual, not functional, it's emotional. It's incumbent upon designers to make the through-flow of work and communication as pleasurable as possible and as emotionally rich as possible. Over the last 30 years, the world around us has changed. The crystal speak even more. There is a message. In an age of abundant consumer choice, design has shifted focus from serving the collective good to indulging individual desire. As designers have devised ever new and more sophisticated ways to fulfill our personal aspirations and sell us more stuff. It's not enough that it looks well and works well. It has to be flat and green to a brown box. To let the bird sing when the water boils makes for the personality of this kettle. We live in the ultimate designer age. But is this democracy or decadence? Can we have too much of a good thing? And are we really ready for design that's so personal, it's practically human? The thing is alive, it's interacting with you, it's yakking, it's demanding things. It really wants to work itself into the texture of your day. And finally, with the raw materials that have fueled 200 years of industrial production running out, where next for design? The exciting thing about Cradle to Cradle is that things are designed to either go back to soil safely or back to industry forever. And so we can celebrate consumption instead of as something that destroys the world, as something that enhances the world. things and building them you know and I typically tend to build one or two or three because that's all I could afford to do but I always wanted to address mass production that kind of is the ultimate goal for a designer I think shaping everything from airplanes to coat hangers Mark Newson is one of the hippest designers on the planet An artist reaping the rewards of an age in which the profile of design has never been higher. And today, seated on Philippe Stark designer chairs, sipping designer water, wealthy aficionados are about to do battle to own one of his first works. Now we come to lot 72, Mark Newson. The rare and important lucky luck. And we will begin this at 300,000 pounds. 300,000 to start this. I have 320. I was uh, 23, I think, or 24 when I, when I did that, when I built that, when I designed it and when I made it. 480, seated on my right, and 480, 500,000. I didn't have the money to go and get a manufacturer to do it. At 750 against you, madam, 750, 780. Manufacturers didn't exist in Australia in that sense. So, you know, even if I did, it wouldn't have been possible. 900,000 I have. At 900,000, that's against you, madam. It was simply building something in my backyard. At 950,000 pounds then. Sold, 
Thank you so much. Do not adjust your sets. That's just shy of a million pounds for a chair. Making this probably the most desirable piece of furniture in the world. But don't panic. Mark Newson makes high street dish trainers as well as exclusive furniture. He's the latest in a line of high profile, influential designers to confront a curious dilemma. In the age of the individual, how can a mass produced object feel like a desirable one off? Theirs is the story of how design got personal. And it begins with a generation fed up with the dull and dismal world of the 1970s. No one seemed to really care how mass-produced products looked. And I was interested in having interesting and, in a way, aspirational possessions. And even though this was a four or five pound album, I didn't see why it had to be in any way lesser to a luxury item. Dance, 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 dance to the radio. When he began designing record covers at the end of the 70s, Peter Saville wasn't alone in bemoaning the state of design in Britain. I had gone to a British week in Sweden some years previously, and I was really appalled at the poor design quality of British goods. Britain's newly elected leader and the entrepreneurs of the post-punk generation had more in common than either may care to admit. Both championed consumer choice, individuality, and a do-it-yourself deregulatory spirit that would turn the 80s into the designer decade. For Peter Saville, that meant plundering a range of enigmatic and eclectic images to design record sleeves every bit as desirable as the music they concealed. I picked up this, um, well, a postcard of, of this Fantin Latour painting called Roses. And I, I picked it up because I liked the chintz-like quality of it. And my friend was with me. And she saw me holding the, the, the Fantin Latour postcard and, and um, said, you're not thinking of that, are you? And, um, and I said, no, no, of course not. I was interested in producing things that I would own and that my audience would own. So not pictures of what other people had, but actually things. So in my home in the early, in the early 80s, I didn't have a Fantan at all. Um, I had a vase with some flowers in it each week. Um, and I quite liked the idea of having a Fantan at all. And I saw these, in a way, kind of pop products as a way of having that. And it is about acquisition. It's driven by aspiration and a personal desire to have some things. And following on from centuries of from centuries of people not having things, I mean, you know, I mean, it is it is a it's a wonder of of the post-war period that people now have the opportunity to have things. It's it's brilliant. And if those things make them feel better about themselves and without a doubt the kind of design object brings with it this sense of self-enhancement and the sense of knowing more than you did before. These are all positive things. Peter Saville's record covers invested design with the same cultural status as pop music, art or fashion. But while popular culture was characteristically ahead of the game, 
Britain's best industrial designers were scrabbling about on scrap heaps. I yanked two Rover car seats from a scrapyard and I put them on the frame. And the mechanism is great because um, you use your back. In, in, in modern car seats, you have to turn something. And here, you just let pull the handle back and you decide with your back where to stop and you lock it. And it's great. I mean, it's like, it is, um, I'm not selling it to you now, but it is an amazing seat. completely ready-made. I mean, there's not much design there. It had more to do with Picasso's Toro, which is a leather bicycle seat and a handlebar making the horns and the whole idea behind the ready-made. In the early 80s, in Britain at least, there was as yet no mass market for designers inspired as much by avant-garde art as industrial production. But in the spiritual home of post-war design, change was in the air. Since the end of the Second World War, nobody has indulged designers as adoringly as the Italians. And nowhere in Italy, more so than here, in Milan. We always try to bring a concept, a proposal, uh, like uh, the sofa to work, like the sofa to have sex, uh, like uh, I don't know what. Here, design is an important industrial and philosophical affair. Its status upheld by intellectual heavyweights like this guy. Always, always, from the beginning, the idea of design was debated as an intellectual action and not just as a service to the industry. And so that's why design, probably in Milano, had always the sort of, uh, was very much related with life. A legend in his lifetime, Ettore Sozzas was heavily influenced by the free thinking of the 60s counterculture. But by the end of the 70s, in an age of increasingly conspicuous consumption, he argued that it was design's job to offer consumer choice, variety, and abundance. And at the opening of an exhibition of furniture in Milan in 1981, he delivered in shocking style. Life is fashion. Every day you are changing your, your dress. I think that also you have to change your house. You are young, you have one certain house. Then you are growing older, then you marry, then you have children, then you leave your wife or you have a lover or whatever it is. Why should the house be a temple that never moves? Welcome to Memphis. A collective of young designers brought together by Sotsas to bring some personality to the production line. When I saw the drawing of it, of this bookcase, was was really like to, to open a totally new world. If you put the books, the books, they never stand. And the books, in any case, they will lie against the, the walls. To create a piece of furniture to hold books uh, without taking care of uh, the, the rational composition, the function to have books, I think uh, was really the starting point for, for something 
something that at the time we didn't know what, what it was, but uh, uh, it's something that still is touching me today, almost 30 years after. Oh, the ragman draws circles up and down the black. Named after a Bob Dylan song, but also invoking the ancient capital of Egypt and the home of Elvis Presley, Memphis struck an anything goes attitude that poured scorn on the traditions of industrial design. We started just breaking every rules. We wanted to be more exciting, more provocative, with colors, decoration, unbelievable shape, unexpected furniture, unexpected idea of environment, something that could create a positive, happy, um, friendly relation with uh, furniture, environment, technology, without any convention, without any possible um, rule coming from the past. But the ringleader of the Memphis Rebellion understood that to break the rules, it's best to master them first. Sotsas really was a very capable, traditional industrial designer. I mean, he made all kinds of objects, tape recorders, typewriters, sophisticated, complicated industrial design tasks. Memphis really was a reform from within industrial design to break functionality and to sort of liberate design to go into into spaces that it had forbidden itself. For Memphis, the principles that had underpinned good design throughout the 20th century, rational, functional, long-lasting, were a thing of the past. In the fashion-driven, free-market consumer society, the customer was king. And if he or she wanted multicolored wonky shelves in plastic laminate this season, then they were going to get them. Sotsas's furniture, for good or for bad, was perhaps the signal disruption of you know, the continuous stream of modernist idealism which had begun with the Bauhaus. Memphis certainly meant the end of the hegemony of modernism. Modernism sought to make the world a better place for all. Memphis prefigured a new idea where the collective good made way for individual desire. And that meant the rise of a new kind of designed object. Now the flap is the same shape as the bedside table, isn't it? It is. It has it's a, a handle, elliptical end. It has a handle built into the yeah. end of it as well. That would make more sense of that too. So first thing we want to do, we're going to just quickly. Michael Graves is one of the world's most successful industrial designers, shaping everything from salad spoons to hospital wards. And they need a place to put it down. He made his name first in architecture, and then in design with objects like this. It is a little bit like a little temple, but then it isn't. It's a teapot. In 1980, Italian steel company Alessi commissioned 11 architects to each produce a sterling silver tea and coffee set. They were intended as exhibition pieces only. But when Graves sold 30 or so of his set at around $25,000 a time, this limited edition inspired a defining moment in the history of mass-produced design. Alessi came to us and asked us to make what he called an American pot. First of all, he wanted a kettle that would boil water faster than any other kettle on the market to boil water faster than others. 
It's a matter of the slope of the side, uh, the coverage over the heating element, the cone shape of the kettle. He wanted a kettle that wouldn't burn your hand, obviously. So the handle was going to be here so that it's very, very comfortable and it's also blue. Whether one uh, attributes red to hot and blue to cool, I'm not quite sure, but you're supposed to. Um, and the black knob here was neutral. At this point, they've sold about a million seven hundred thousand. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot of tea kettles. This is probably the best-selling kettle of all time. A design classic that has spawned countless variations and versions. In part, its form follows function, just as the modernists insisted. But that's just half the story, because this simple kettle pulled off a remarkable trick. Here was a mass-produced object that felt unique. A kettle with charisma that represented a contradiction in terms. A mass icon. We didn't want our design objects to be so slick and abstract and born only out of the Industrial Revolution, but we wanted to bring us back into it. Long ago, in a flea market, I found a kettle that had a kind of rooster here. It was very badly done. It was done by somebody at home. Yet I thought the idea was clever. To let the bird sing when the water boils, and it makes for the personality of this kettle. It has created a sense of desire to own it. Imbued with a sense of aspiration, Graves' kettle defined much of the design of the decade and beyond. People really wanted to define their own sort of cultural expectations and ambitions with these objects. And people would want you to come into the home and say, good Lord, look at your kettle. I mean, which they hadn't said before. People didn't come to each other's homes and say, wow, I think your kettle's fantastic. Years ago, if people had been very grand and had loads of money, they'd buy great master paintings to hang in their country houses. And they'd say, come and see my Turner or my Gainsborough. Now, the equivalent people with aspiration and ambition, a different sense in the modern world, could say, come and see my kettle, <laughs> my designer kettle, my designer lemon squeezer, my designer vacuum cleaner. For some, this cultural upgrade was distancing design from its unique ability to connect form and function, degrading it into a tool for selling us stuff. Stuff we may want, but may or may not need. For others, it was redefining the very notion of function itself. Here is an object that doesn't actually perform very well, that's been used across the world to proclaim design modernity in a thousand, a million new homes, produced by the, the most self-publicizing, self-branded designer in the history of the universe. When I make millions of pieces which give the right service at the right price and the right place for people, I have the right also to just make poetry. The crystal speak even more. There is a message. I have no style. The thing which fits the most with me is the freedom. For over 30 years, Philippe Stark has been delighting an adoring audience who couldn't care less about the old-fashioned notion of form follows function. It's a lot of palaver, 
it's not pointy enough and the collection system is very imperfect. You should have something that collects and filters out the pips. That's what matters. At some point, pips will come out, and where do you put them? They go straight in the glass. But it's lovely fun to watch the lemon juice trickling down at those reedy, pointy bits. I am a, a street functionalist in the way that functionalism was in the 20s in Germany. In the 20s in Germany, the functionalism was purely materialistic. There was, I don't know exactly, we can say it, five or six parameters. The weight, how you, 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 you bent the tube, uh, how that fold, and things like that. But since this time, there is Sigmund Freud, there is the French philosopher Lacan, and we know that there is not only materialistic parameters, there is immaterial parameters, like poetry, humor, sex, and things like that. We can say that I am a post-Freudian functionalist. But this function now are more rich than before because we know more about us. That's the difference. I'm very happy because some people come to me and say, thank you. Thank you for what you do for us. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. I'm very proud of that. And what you do, oh, you know, I, I met my, my wife in one of your hotels and we had a so good sex in your uh, hotel in a guest, a guest room. Right? Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you. Really, that touched me because finally it's a maximum I can do with my job. We can try to inject so many things, political, sexual, and all, but at the end, you just bring a little pleasure. Stark's brand of pleasure-seeking raised the profile of design. But many couldn't afford it. And in Britain, where old habits die hard, many didn't want it, particularly in the home, where it took a bunch of subversive Swedes and a biting recession to make over the British attitude to design. Chuck out that chins, come on, do it today. Rise off that pelmet and throw it away. Those sofas are girly, too silly, too twirly. That flowery bed, it just does you no credit. Despite pop modernism, what people were actually buying for their houses was more archaic ornament. And all that stuff was backward looking. Our homes could be playful and happy and light, loose and informal and... So they issued these very, very funny challenges. Look at your ridiculous English pretensions, look at your suburban slonisms, and throw them out. Get rid of it. Chuck out the chins. Chuck out that chins! Yes, chuck out that chins! Let's chuck out that chins! On October the 19th, 1987, a stock collapse of unprecedented scale pitched Britain towards recession. The same month, on an industrial estate near Warrington, a new furniture store opened, perfectly timed to introduce the British to a revolutionary new retail experience, whose motto was democratic design. We have always hated air, to transport air. To be a designer at IKEA, it's, it's not enough that it looks well and works well. It has to be flat and go into a brown box. A giant, automated distribution warehouse sits at the heart of IKEA headquarters in rural Sweden.
This is the center of the most successful global furniture company of all time. It has single-handedly transformed the way we consume design. And it all began 60 years ago in 1955 with this, IKEA's first range of furniture. Followed a year later by this groundbreaking table. It's a table called Lövet. Actually, our first designer who was employed here was, uh, his name was Gillis Lundgren. He was employed in 1954. And his work was to set up for the catalog and do photo shooting. And he was, uh, have a lot of things around him. And then he had to make a photo with Lövet and not only one Lövet, there should be a number of Lövet standing there. And then suddenly he realized, well, when he was finished that, where should I place it? He has just a very small area. And then he looked at it and thought, well, why don't I just screw off the legs? And that's how it started. And from there we have been obsessed in finding ways of doing our furniture flat. In the early 50s, IKEA's founder, Ingvar Kamprad, visited the Milan Furniture Fair. He loved the furniture, he hated the prices and vowed to democratize design by cutting the cost. Many of our competitors, they actually use design to charge more. Our view is exactly the opposite. We use the design to really come to the lowest price so people can afford to buy things. So we have a completely other view of how to use design. During the 1980s, Design had come to mean prestige, something you paid extra for. IKEA proposed the opposite. You could charge less by building the whole process of industrial design around the economies that flat pack self assembly furniture made possible. It is a lot about considering these. Uh all these different aspects. Low price, long lasting, sustainable, flat pack. You have to somehow solve to have a good product. For example, how can you break down things into pieces or segments or making puzzles of things? Could this be repeated? Yes, it could, but you don't know exactly how, what kind of joint or what kind of material. If you manage to solve all the parameters around the problem, then you have a good design and uh, it will be most likely competitive among other products. So, was that clear? Yeah? Sounds simple but there's a twist. They give you functional design with just enough color, pattern, and humor to satisfy the individual in you. Standardized, but personal. Mass-produced, but homely. Modernism meets Memphis for the price of peanuts. 160 clicks. Nice. But you have to scour the in-store warehouse. Find, fetch carry and even build it yourself. Not everybody's idea of retail therapy. It's quite difficult for me to want to uh, you know, condemn a business which claims to have 560 million customers you know, worldwide. Can 560 million people be wrong? Can I be right? Well, possibly, but I just think the sense to which the whole experience of being an IKEA customer is 
so diminished. To visit an IKEA store is to experience sort of humiliation and degradation, which is only uh, only normally available in a in a psychiatric hospital or an airport. It's you know it's a horrible horrible experience. But loathe it or love it, it's curious that in the age of the individual, such a depersonalized consumer experience should become so successful. Particularly when another field of design was heading in entirely the opposite direction. Shrinking the ultimate industrial machine into an essential consumer product. 40 years ago, Computers were vast, expensive, intimidating machines owned by governments, corporations, and military institutions. The stuff of science fiction. But in 1984, a new machine was unveiled as the world of computing got personal. It was launched with a huge amount of hoopla in 1984 with a famous Ridley Scott, I think, commercial based on, on you know, the idea of 1984 and how we were all subject to the tyranny of uh, the IBM computer and its dullness and the command line of CPM as it then was. It said hello on it in large friendly letters, to quote Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Those large friendly letters were not insignificant. There's a keyboard and this mouse, this extraordinary mouse. It was just so revolutionary. It was amazing. Boasting a revolutionary user interface, the Apple Mac would set the bar for a new kind of digital design. This was the dawn of a new age in which the words personal and computer were no longer anathema. When we're presented with an object that is complex, it can be intimidating. It certainly can give you the sense that we don't understand it. And we, we, are, we are often intimidated, aren't we, by by objects and products that we don't understand. And so clarity and simplicity are, I think, critically important for us to be able to understand a product um, and, and enjoy using it. Making design user-friendly has become essential to making once unimaginably complex technology part of the fabric of everyday life. But Apple wasn't the first outfit to preach the benefits of this revolutionary new approach to design. Almost 20 years before the launch of the Mac, in December 1968, a research team funded by the American military and headed by a young electrical engineer called Doug Engelbart staged a startling presentation. I hope you'll go along with this rather unusual setting and the fact that I remain seated when I get introduced and the fact that I'm going to come to you mostly through this medium here for the rest of the show. The research program that I'm going to describe to you is quickly characterizable by saying, if in your office you as an intellectual worker were supplied with a computer display backed up by a computer that was alive for you all day, how much value could you derive from that? Computers were big and expensive, <laughs> and only very special people got to use them. The demo showed people that computers could be useful for everyday activities for everyday people. Let me go to a file that I prepared just after my wife called me and said, on the way home, would you do a little shopping for me? So as soon as she said that, I uh, got my system organized.
and made a shopping list. So Doug's real interest was in designing some sort of a computer system at that point that would allow us to manipulate text, to store our documents and manipulate our documents. I say after bananas, it's more likely that I'll uh, take the carrots there, and so carrots move right up behind bananas, and aspirin doesn't really belong there. Uh, I think aspirin goes after paper. People that we could get to the lab to see it could understand it, but, but people that didn't see it and experience it just couldn't imagine what it was because computers were for computing. You put cards or paper tape in and you got numbers out and that's what you did with them and the idea of using them to write documents and write programs and dynamically communicate with one another just wasn't, they just couldn't understand it. I mean, it was just outside their frame of reference. In an analog age of black and white television and final records, Engelbart's boffins prophesized a digital future of personal computers, controlled simply through what the user saw on the screen. And they built their vision around a new wooden device as revolutionary then as it is commonplace today. It has two wheels here. And the idea is that you hold it on a table and the wheels have a little device inside that can then tell the computer how fast they're rotating and the computer figured out how to then have a spot move across the screen. It had a wire coming out of it from the wrong end, actually today they come out the other end, and the wire became known as the tail and the device then became known as the mouse. <laughs> This is the one that I built in 1963. Actually, the first mouse that was ever built. Doug had a sketch in his one of his pocket notebooks about something like this with two wheels. And he gave it to me, and I thought, that, that looks good. And uh, that was really the first one. The mouse and the interface it controlled quite simply changed everything. And Engelbart's demo represented nothing short of a design revolution, the democratization of computing, a liberating and lucrative prospect for the entrepreneurial young designers of Silicon Valley. In other disciplines, designers have always considered the people who are going to be using the products. In the computer industry, the designers always considered the people who are going to be using the products. It's just that they were all computer people until this point in time. And then they were, you know, just like regular people off the street who were going to be using the product. This shift changed the rules of design. If computers were going to be used by ordinary people, it suggested, why not ask them what they wanted? And when asked to design a computer editing system for a publishing company, that's exactly what this guy did. So we had just hired a secretary, and the day after she started, I put her in front of a blank screen, and I said, imagine there's a page on the screen, and here's a page of markups, little proofreader's marks, of what needs to be changed. Imagine that you had a way to point at the screen and a keyboard and um, tell me what you would do. And she said, well, um, I have to delete that. I would point at it and cross it out. I have to insert some text. I would point at the place I wanted to go, and then I would type it. So she just made it up as she went along, what was intuitive to her. The result was an intuitive, user-friendly system based around the graphic layout and editing features that still dominate personal computing today. All held together by another iconic piece of design. I'm sitting in a bar one evening and I'm waiting for a friend of mine to show up and I'm, I'm doodling on this napkin. And what I came up with was a desk. 
and it was on the desk that the, that the typewriter was and the editing happened and the in-out trays for handling mail. Separate from that, there was a, an icon that represented a printer and another one that represented a file cabinet and one that represented a trash can. And what I saw in this was the ability for people to, to, to basically manipulate objects in a, you know, almost in a physical way. The majority of things we control, we control physically. You know, you drive a car, you pick up a pen. And so what we were looking for was an analog to the way we controlled a lot of other tools and a lot of other devices in our lives. The user interface developed at Xerox Park brought together the mouse and the desktop and directly inspired the team behind the Apple Mac as its designers became obsessed with how to make a personal computer not just functional, but friendly. We've been struggling with having menus on the top of a window. So I ended up, I said, look, if we put the menu at the top of the whole screen, then we always have the full width, we always have the full height, and every menu will feel like it has a kinesthetic place on the screen. The file menu is always over here, and you can actually reach for the edit menu and be halfway down it before you even thought about that it was cut you were going for. As you pass the names of the menus, each menu would pop down one at a time. And going back and forth, and it would flutter like that, and the menus would come down. You'd go up and down, and, and they would highlight each item. And there was just something completely different from anything you'd ever seen before. By having these things flutter along, it feels like they're all there, but they're not really. They're, they're overlapping quite a bit. But it feels like they're all there at any time. These guys could go on all night. That's what designers do. Obsess about the details so that you don't have to. So to cut a long story short, the principles of user-centered design have made some of the most complex consumer products man has ever made, an essential part of our everyday world, through design that aims to be all but invisible. I mean, we're trying to define products that, in a sense, seem so inevitable and so natural that, in an odd way, you don't almost think of them as being designed. You know, that they, they just solve a problem, but in solving that problem, they're not reminding you of the complexity of this terrible challenge that you faced as a designer. And as a user, I don't want to be reminded about, well, you know, this was a tough problem to solve, because, you know, that's your job. I want this product to be about what this product is supposed to do for me. I think those sorts of preoccupations, I think, lead to, to or can lead to a product like the iPod. Digital devices have become so commonplace, it's difficult to imagine how we live without them. But they have also prompted a profound shift in our relationship with the world around us. And that may or may not be for the good. So direct has our connection between this device we have in our pocket uh, and, and our sense of ourself become that we almost stop thinking about other people around us. And that, love these things as I do, seems to me to be positively dangerous or malignant as an influence on society. So um, a genie has been let out of the bottle and we have to decide whether or not we understand that genie or we understand our behaviour. Can we compare it to when the motor car changed the world or the telephone or print? I don't know exactly. If you buy an old Bell telephone system, like the standard Henry Dreyfus classic, there was a bell inside it, it rang, you picked up the headset, the headset fit onto your head, you, you conveyed the message, and you put it down. Now, it really wants to work itself into the texture of your day. 
the thing is alive, it's interacting with you, it's jacking, it's demanding things. Can I tell all your friends where you are? Would you like to locate with the GPS system here? Would you like to tell your friends to come meet you, have coffee, this is Starbucks? This is a form of behavior that we did not expect from machines. Perhaps design has got so carried away with what it could do for us, it's forgotten to ask whether it should. Surely it's design's job to shield us from, as well as connect us to, technology that is changing what it means to be human. These are issues yet to be fully explored. Lucky then that designers may find themselves with time in their hands because digital devices are also shrinking the world of industrial design. If an object has all this inbred interactivity in it, what are industrial designers supposed to do with objects? Suffer. MP3s do not require racks. All this ingenuity that was invented in CD racks, telephone answering machines, fax machines, music players of all kinds, pocket calendars, tape players, cassette players, video players, cameras, video cameras. It's as if they were designing magic lantern slides. It's just plain gone. There are some who see the future of design entirely in these immaterial terms physical objects becoming largely a thing of the past. It sounds far-fetched, but it's certainly worth thinking about, because otherwise, we're headed for a crisis. The history of industrial design is the story of how capitalism's primal urge to make more for less transformed the natural into a designed world, full of stuff. But with landfill sites bulging and oil slowly but surely running out, it seems that the age of conspicuous consumption may have come to an end. Or maybe not. These are astonishing times. And I'd like to talk this morning uh, on the theme of Greener by Design as a celebration of abundance. And I'd like to use the concept of abundance rather than limits as the framework for our thinking. This looks like an ordinary office with ordinary desks and ordinary chairs. But what you're looking at is a radical design response to a global crisis. Well, this looks like it's just an office chair, but it's not. A typical chair is not designed for future generations of materials. Often it creates what we call hybrids of materials, so that plastics are attached to metals, Different plastics are fused and glued together. They can't come apart. All the elements of this chair, the plastics, the metals, the wires, the fabrics, are all designed to be safe for human and ecological systems. And it can go back in its parts to industrial materials that can go back to becoming new industrial products. Voila. Oftentimes, when things are, quote, recycled, they're actually downcycled. They're actually losing quality on the way. So you might take a milk jug or a piece of clear plastic and then recycle it into something that's dark plastic that, that is an amalgam, a, a, a sort of melange of materials. And it's what we call uh, downcycling. In the case of this chair, we're looking at true recycling, that everything here is designed to stay at its level of quality as it goes through the recycling and not get mixed up into a park bench or a speed bump or a flower pot, but to actually be available to industry at the highest level of quality. 
So it's what we call, you know, cradle to cradle design. The Think Chair is the world's first fully certified cradle to cradle product. Its components and materials, all of which are entirely non toxic, are designed to be infinitely reused. If all products were made this way, our whole world could be produced and reproduced over and over without the need for any new raw materials, from mass produced objects to the ground beneath our feet. Well, this is something as simple as a piece of carpet, but the materials it's made out of are designed to be infinitely reusable. So this carpet has been fully defined as a technical nutrient carpet in our language. So this is a polymer that makes the face fiber, and this is the, the backing. So the tops are designed to be uh, separated from the backs when it comes back for uh, reuse, and then the top becomes caprolactam once again and becomes the face fiber, and the bottom becomes this thermoplastic polyolefin, and it gets remade into a new carpet, and out it goes. There's about two billion kilos of carpet waste in the United States every year. And so you can imagine if these carpets could become carpets again forever, we could take this gi giant polymer bank of two billion kilos and turn it into our carpet for the United States ad infinitum. Made from new materials so green, you could safely eat them. This carpet turns the prevailing idea that we need to consume less on its head. With cradle-to-cradle -cradle design, you get to be ecological and keep shopping. I think with environmentalism, a lot of people think we have to cut back. And the exciting thing about cradle-to-cradle -cradle is that things are designed to either go back to soil safely or back to industry forever. And so we can celebrate consumption instead of as something that destroys the world, as something that enhances the world. Edible carpets and reusable chairs may or may not be the answer to the crisis facing industrial design. But it is a characteristically creative response to a human problem. Another bold attempt to reshape, improve, and make sense of our world. That's what design does. And that's why we need it now, perhaps more than ever. This ability to sort of back away from the material world and think about it in methods which are wiser, deeper, better considered, that's what differentiates design from all the craft work that's been going on ever since we were pre-human. It's deep. It's not a superficial practice. It's not about glamour, or branding, or typography. It really is about mankind and what mankind has created. And that's, uh, that's a big issue. Shakespeare gets a bit of a revamp later. Capulets from one school, Montagues from another. When Romeo met Juliet is at nine. Next, though, BBC Two's chugging up to Carlisle on a great British railway journey. Vote for your greatest rock and roll stars. Freddie Mercury was an opera singer. No one played like Hendrix. I would love to play with Jimmy Page. I think what made Kurt Cobain such a great front person is just his writing and his voice. I'd certainly start recalling some people from the dead. Keith Moon. Boy, Keith Moon. Him and Animal from the Muppets. As we reveal the nation's favourite band. Led Zeppelin. You didn't mess with the Beatles. They were the kings. Join me, Jonathan Ross, for I'm in a rock and roll band live. Saturday at 10 o'clock on BBC Two. 
keeping the car, the Queen's Birthday Parade is fabric of the nation stuff. And there is only one standard that we're allowed, and that's the standard of excellence. Still, oh! By the time we shoot the pull on horse guards, nine weeks before that, we'll have been fighting the Taliban. The Queen and Country, Monday at 9 on BBC One. I just want to get rid of this feeling. There's nothing like getting away from it all. There must be something else. <laughs> For getting a true sense of perspective. I can see my flaws more clearly. All our baggage just disappeared. Six women give up their everyday lives to become tribal wives. Tuesday at 9 on BBC Two. A different route than expected for tonight's leg of the Great British Railway journey. In a change to the build episode now, BBC Two is off to settle.